Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 directors fired or replaced on a movie. I remember thinking, no, this isn't real. There's some misunderstanding. They're going to work it out. Don't panic, Richard. For this list, we'll be taking a look at filmmakers who were set to helm a major motion picture, but eventually exited for one reason or another. What never made version of a movie do you wish you could have seen? Tell us in the comments. A Jedi's weapon deserves more respect. Number 10, Brian Singer, Bohemian Rhapsody. There was a, a lapse in time where our director was not present and we needed to find a new director. And I think, you know, that says it all. The opening credits might read directed by Brian Singer, but several unsung heroes brought this music biopic to the finish line. Throughout production, Singer reportedly clashed with star Rami Malek and arrived late to set. The final straw came in late 2017 when Singer failed to show up for work, claiming that his mother was sick. You're out. What do you mean? I want you out of my life. With more than two weeks of shooting left, Singer was fired. The day after Dexter Fletcher was named as his replacement, Singer was met with a lawsuit from Cesar Sanchez Guzman. Despite Singer's alleged unprofessional behavior and controversial legal troubles, he maintained sole directing credit on Bohemian Rhapsody per DGA rules. The film went on to become a smash hit, although nobody mentioned Singer in their Oscar acceptance speeches. Well, I'm terribly sorry, dear. It's done. Number nine, Alex Cox, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. I need this, right? I remember your face. There is no way of explaining the terror I felt. This drug-fueled road trip comedy was polarizing for critics and audiences alike, and there was a passionate debate behind the scenes too, as director Alex Cox clashed with his cast and crew. Star Johnny Depp and author Hunter S. Thompson, who penned the original source material, reportedly were not fans of Cox's script. I think we should leave that poor bastard alone. He told me he was gonna turn in early, so. Cox also butted heads with producer Layla Nabolsi over creative differences, leading to the studio to hire Monty Python's Terry Gilliam as Cox's replacement. Although Gilliam and Tony Grissoni rewrote the script, Cox and Todd Davies still retain co-writing credits. This was not the time for a showdown. This was Death Valley. Number eight, Steven Soderbergh, Moneyball. This better work. I'm just kidding you. Steven Soderbergh was actually brought on board to replace director David Frankel for this adaptation of Michael Lewis's book. The Oscar winner had a unique vision for the film, taking a documentary-style approach, with real-life athletes like Scott Hatterberg and David Justice playing themselves. Mere days before shooting was set to commence, the movie was postponed, and Soderbergh was eventually let go. Hey, you agree with this? 100%. Bennett Miller of Capote assumed directorial duties, and Aaron Sorkin was hired to work on a third version of the script. While the end product might have been more traditional than Soderbergh's initial idea, Moneyball was still a home run, earning six Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture. Number seven, Richard Donner, Superman 2. Did you see that? Did you see what I did? In 1977, Richard Donner was tasked with directing two Superman movies simultaneously. Both films were initially slated for a 1978 release, but only the first was ready. While Donner got through shooting 75% of the sequel, he was controversially replaced with Richard Lester. Due to Directors Guild of America rules, Lester reshot several scenes in order to get a full director credit. Some of Donner's scenes still made it into the film, though, due to scheduling and budgetary reasons. In 2006, Donner finally got to share his version of Superman 2 when a re-edited director's cut was released. Number six, George Cukor, Gone with the Wind. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. 
Gone with the Wind and The Wizard of Oz share an interesting connection. Richard Thorpe was originally set to direct Oz, but when producer Mervyn Leroy disapproved of his work, George Cukor became a creative advisor and Victor Fleming the director. But even if he didn't, you'd be no worse off than you are now. Yes, that's true. Cukor soon left the production to direct Gone with the Wind, but when he ran into conflicts with producers and star Clark Gable, he was replaced by Victor Fleming. Although both films went on to be nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars, Gone with the Wind won out, and Fleming brought home a Best Director statuette. No, I haven't forgotten. Number five, Edgar Wright, Ant-Man. <laughs> It takes a special kind of director to make a superhero like Ant-Man both badass and playfully self-aware. Having brought Scott Pilgrim to the silver screen, Edgar Wright seemed like the perfect candidate for the job. Was that not clear? Was that not clear? Although Wright was attached to the project for years, he ultimately left production over clashing visions. As Wright put it in a Variety interview, quote, I wanted to make a Marvel movie, but I don't think they really wanted to make an Edgar Wright movie. While Peyton Reed took over as the film's director, Wright's screenplay and story contributions still received credit. Wright never intends to watch the finished film, but reportedly has no hard feelings towards the studio. Feels kind of, kind of weird, you know? Yeah. Number four, Dick Richards, Jaws. You're gonna need a bigger boat. Jaws not only gave birth to the summer movie season, but also established Steven Spielberg as a great director. Believe it or not, Spielberg wasn't the original choice to helm this game-changing blockbuster. Producers Richard D. Zanuck and David Brown initially hired Dick Richards, but grew frustrated as he repeatedly referred to the shark as a whale. You know the thing about a shark? He's got lifeless eyes, black eyes, like a doll's eye. When he comes at you, doesn't seem to be living until he bites you. Thus, Richards walked the plank and Spielberg was brought aboard. At the time, Spielberg was only 26 years old, with just one theatrical release under his belt. While he was still getting his feet wet in the film industry, Spielberg certainly made a splash after this directorial outing. Smile, you son of a <laughs> Number three, Phil Lord and Christopher Miller. Solo, a Star Wars story. I don't like it. I don't agree with it. But I accept it. A Han Solo origin story from the builders behind the Lego movie? We have a really good feeling about this. <laughs> <laughs> what was I just thinking? I don't care. At least we did until Lord and Miller left the captain's cockpit. Lucasfilm took issue with the duo's emphasis on comedy. Co-screenwriter Lawrence Kasdan also didn't appreciate their willingness to let the cast improv. Ron Howard was handed the Falcon's keys, reshooting nearly 70%. While Solo wasn't poorly received, it was seen as remarkably average, becoming the franchise's first financial letdown. We'll never know what might have been, but considering Lord and Miller's success with Spider-Man, we'd love to visit the reality where they finished Solo, and maybe the one where Colin Trevorrow did Rise of Skywalker. A Jedi's weapon deserves more respect. Number two, Zack Snyder, Justice League. I agree. It was initially rumored that Zack Snyder had been fired from Justice League, but he actually left the project due to the tragic death of his daughter. Joss Whedon was enlisted to see the film through post-production and reshoots. Although Whedon had experience directing superhero crossovers, his quippy style didn't mesh with the darker tone that Snyder had established. Whedon's alleged on-set behavior didn't help the film's reputation as it went on to become a certified bomb. No! This cannot be! But after years of fans demanding that the studio release the so-called Snyder Cut, the original director was given a chance to fully realize his vision for the film. Clocking in at more than four hours, Zack Snyder's Justice League is widely considered the definitive version. Fly, son. It's time. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into settings and switch on your notifications. Number 1. 
Richard Stanley, The Island of Dr. Moreau. Why have you done this? Don't you feel the heat as I do? I, I, I can't tolerate the sun. After four years, director Richard Stanley was finally given the go-ahead to adapt H.G. Wells' classic novel. Problems quickly began to pile up with actors dropping out, delays due to bad weather, and Marlon Brando fleeing to his private island after his daughter tragically took her own life. Additionally, star Val Kilmer proved unreliable and exceedingly difficult to work with. Why have you locked the door? This is for your own good. The studio fired Stanley via fax. John Frankenheimer was hired to get the project back on tracks, but even he couldn't save the movie from becoming a box office and critical dud. Stanley's experience with the island of Dr. Moreau was such a nightmare that it inspired a 2004 documentary entitled Lost Soul. None of us had any idea what, what ended up, what was coming. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from Watch Mojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.